Naibis is the most simple algorithm that you can apply to your data. As the name suggests, here this algorithm makes an assumption that all the variables in the data set are naive, that is, not correlated to each other. Naibis is a very popular classification algorithm that is mostly used to get the base accuracy of the data. Keeping the importance of Naibis in mind, we have come up with this tutorial on Naibis classifier. <laughs> Now before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, Cloud and Digital Marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now let's have a quick glance at the agenda. We'll start up by understanding the Bayes theorem and then we'll have a demo on the Naibase algorithm. Uh, I think let's start then. Yeah. We'll wait more because we have so much to cover today. Good. So, um, uh, Raju, you are okay with uh, last week's content, right? The way I dealt with it? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> the same way, what I will do is, um, I will first give you guys, because we have missed some, I have missed some sessions with you, uh, you guys, and I just wanted to give you some insights on what exactly happened. So, last time, uh, did I talk about what is the overall structure of any analytics, uh, you know, project onto the industry side of it? Did I show you the boxes and all? Nothing, right? So far? No, no. We just no. focused on the linear regression now, right? Okay, good. So now I will just give you an overview and I'll try to cover up as much as possible what we have lost because of our sessions. I could not be with you earlier. Yeah. Uh, okay. So usually on an industry scale, uh, what do we do is uh, the data, if we are lucky enough, like there are very few projects or there are very few implementations where the data will be static. Static in the sense, the data that you get in CSV, Excel and all these files. Okay? Yeah. There are very few uh, people who actually work on a, um, always on a static data. Kind of okay? And majorly the yeah. people from, let us say, from the marketing background or from a pre-sales background, or they have a dedicated team where... Uh, Every month redundant, they have to do some reporting part of it. At that time, we can expect such things to happen. But in the usual case, what we do is we fire up the data using the service. So we have got live connection to the server. And uh, we are responsible for fetching the data from all the possible locations on the server. The first okay. step that I call or that I classify it is called data gathering. Yeah. Okay. In this case, we are supposed to gather whatever data we can from multiple sources. So this is a very important step, step because uh, let us say you have certain <coughs> columns on from one, let, let us say we are talking about amazon.com. Okay. Yeah. So when, uh, when you talk about say uh, the production of the site, so there might be a separate server, which is holding all the data. We are talking about warehouse management. There will be a separate data. We are talking about deliveries. There'll be a separate server which will be holding the data. We are talking about customer satisfaction. A lot of data has come from different sites. So this is how we should plan and store basically the data into one data set. Yeah. Post that, what we do is we put this into a major cluster, which we call it as data cleaning or data preparation, basically. So here okay. we are supposed to process, first of all, validate the data. So before processing, I will say, Validate. See, not all data is supposed to go and sit on a machine learning model. Not possible. So initially, what we do is we do data validations. Like, we check if the data is scaled, unscaled, if the data has normality, no normality. Is Are the different columns homoscedastic uh, in the sense, uh, uh, if you talk about linear regression. Okay, so yeah. in case I'm going to represent a line, how many of the points are not going to come on the line? So if I put a line and 99% of the points are outside the line, it makes no sense for me to implement this kind of models. So this yeah. is what we do. So I will pick up topics uh, one by one in each of our sessions, such a way that we cover everything. Post validation, so once we are confirmed that, okay, data looks kind of interesting and could be used into one of the machine learning codes, uh, post that, uh, okay. Um, hi, Nitish, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry, Nitish, perfect. Yes. So, uh, Nitish, what I'm doing is uh, I'm just giving an overview of what happens on the industry side of uh, data science. Okay. So, there's nothing okay. related to the topic today. So, I'll spend around 10 15 minutes every session on covering up whatever we have missed so far. Something okay. extra from my side. Okay. Fair enough. Thank Good. you. And uh, for today's session, uh, I, we are going to complete Navebase. Uh, the theory and practical both part of it. 
then we are going to touch upon to KNN. We'll complete that because it's a very simple topic. And post that, I will also try to complete SVM also. Okay. So that uh, you guys will be prepared for the videos anyway. I know SVM is going to release next week, but uh, it's good to do it together so that you'll come to know what each algorithm is. And even the videos will go very easy. And SVM is little, little troublesome. That's what I feel sometimes if we don't get the concepts. So if we did, okay. we can redo quickly SVM half an hour if in case you people need it. Else we will cover the different topics. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> so uh, post validation, what we do is we do data cleaning. Okay. So in this data cleaning part of it, if in case you have missing values or if in case you feel some of the values are wrong, because not always you will get a perfect uh, valued uh, no, data frame. So in this case, what do we do is we do all these techniques to make the data suitable to, uh, to be used for the implementation. Like the most common problem in the data set is number of zeros or missing values. So for example, if we are talking about a data set and let us say you have got majority of the columns as zeros, what we can do, either we can remove them, okay or we can impute some other value here now the challenge is if we remove it we might lose x percentage of data out of our original data set okay so we have to keep this in mind secondly if we try to impute a value on that we are imputing x percentage of unknown value to an it might change our data set itself we are not sure what we are imputing even if we have multiple techniques it will never be an accurate value definitely Okay, so this, this is a very important topic and I'm going to touch up uh, in a very detailed way because not many, many people, you know, have a good exposure onto data cleaning part of it, especially missing value replacement and all those stuff. Okay, post that, you know, have to organize your data. So let us say if you have some rows and columns to be up and down all this part of it. So I call it data organization. So this is a step where you are going to prepare your data for machine learning. Okay. Post this thing, what you do is we put the push the data into machine learning and we you know get the outputs out of this machine learning stuff. Now after this, we do a very important step. So usually in the software industry, we call it testing. Okay. Well, I will not call it purely testing, but I will say I will take this into a way where we'll try to do some testing onto this machine learning model that we have done. So for example, uh, we'll do performance testing, stress testing, a lot of testings we do. So we'll, we'll take this model and put it into a very stressed environment where we'll come to know what is the minimum uh, accuracy that the model can give before it is invalid or what is the maximum accuracy that the model can give before it breaks down, something like that. Okay. Uh, we call this as feature engineering. So wherein we'll pick up one particular ML, which is the best over here. And we'll try to, you know, improvise accuracy over that. So we'll try to squeeze the maximum accuracy possible. So for example, in the first run, we would have got an accuracy of say 78%, for example. Okay. Now for feature engineering, what we'll do is we'll try to change the variables in and out such a way that at least we would be able to push this to two or 3% more. So let us say we push this to 81%. This is the goal of feature engineering. And also in this step, we try to understand if in case, just in case there are some features from the data set, which are not good for us. We'll try to remove them and try to get a better accuracy. So this is like a last minute, uh, you know, brush up on, on, on the accuracy part of it. Good. And post that, uh, we do visualization, reporting, production, delivery. So a lot of, lot of stuff over there, which happens after. Delivery. So I'm going to, let us say, we'll do this type of stuff at the end of our module so that I will show you how to package your Python code, how, do, how to attach it on to an, you know, web link. If in case it is a web interface, how do you do that? So a lot of things we can do over here. Okay. So, so far for my other batches, whatever I've taken so far is I have covered all these topics one by one, except the last one, which I am supposed to show you in the last session. So what I'll do now is I'll try to, every week we'll try to cover some topics in 10, 15 minutes and I'll, I'll try to give you an overview on what happened so that at least you know, you know the complete picture, what, what goes around. Okay. So, um, uh, Krishna, here, uh, this DP, what you have shown now, mm -hmm. there's only one part it will happen in SQL, right? Uh, no, it has multiple interfaces again. So okay. SQL stuff ends over here. So once we collect the data and put it into a pandas data frame no? in data gathering step. Okay. Yeah. From to... server, you are getting a data and uh, you're putting into a new. Uh, huh, yeah. And this is the second part, the DP part, which I showed is nothing but your pandas data frame itself. We are playing around with pandas here. That's it. Oh, okay. We Python only. All the things are Python only. Everything is in Python from here. Okay. But where SQL comes? 
SQL comes here basically. While before taking from server or once we take it from server? See, SQL is basically a query which we which Python will give it to the server for fetching the data. That's it. So it comes as uh -huh. an initial part of it. Okay, that means getting the data from the server is SQL. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. But not always necessary. That's what I was saying. Uh, if you have a static data, yes, you can work on a static data. Static data means Excel, CSV, yeah. Yeah. HTML, JSON. If you have these kind of files, which are static, like basically it'll be there on your local machine, you can take it a dump. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In that case, you don't need a uh, SQL part. But yes, majority of the stuff is live onto production. So basically what, what it will be is I'll give you an overview of this. Uh, you guys have seen Netflix, right? Yeah. yeah. When you open Netflix, did, do you observe it shows you certain percentage that 98% of uh, this particular movie is recommended for you? Something like that. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. So what we usually do is we do not deploy the stuff as a whole product. Let us say this is a Netflix product. Okay. Just an example. And there will be a small microservice. I hope you all get the concept of microservice. It's like a small function within a live product. When the product requests something, some, some stuff or some you know, function will happen or it will go around certain function. It will give a small data output to the production uh, or the product basically. This is what will be your ML or AI, whatever you say. We cannot expect the whole uh, product to be working only on AI. So right now, these, these things are deployed as a small microservices to them. So be it be a web client or be an uh, you know, API or be a mobile client. So whatever it is, usually ML is a smaller part of this stuff. So these guys will give some data, we will process it using our ML and we'll throw the data back to them. That's it. So in this case, yes, live SQL in and out is happening because everything is coming from production. So we cannot expect to have these guys to convert into Excel and then Excel will input and we'll not do that. Okay. So I'll take you guys through this also. So at the ending of our module, I will try to show you guys how to package your Python code, how to deploy it on the web, how to interface and all that. We'll do it locally. So coming to the concept of last time we did linear regression, I hope everybody got it. Yeah. So now, uh, I think we finished log R also, no? Logistic regression. Yes. yes. Good. Good so on the same concept of log R, today we are going to see how if in case we have exactly two categorical variables, it is one and zero, true and false, yes and no, as our target variables, if in case they are exactly two in number, what other techniques we can do? So we can do something called naive base. Now this is completely depend on probability distribution functions. I, I hope you guys are good with at least probability distribution functions. If not, I'll take you guys across this and I have an Excel file to showcase it, like a simulation the way we did last time, same way we'll do naive base today. So this is an alternate technique. If in case log R, if you feel is giving a little low accuracy, you can even go ahead and do a neighbors. Post that, we will see a dynamic technique called KNN, K nearest neighbors. So it is one of the most simplest techniques in machine learning. Okay. And post that, we are going to see one of the most complex techniques, which is SVM. Okay. I'll give you, if in case we don't get time on this, I'll give you an overview of SVM at least, so that the videos that you see will be easy for you guys. And then next week, we'll continue on the code. Everybody good with Bayes' theorem here? Yes, definitely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the formula looks a little scary, but uh, it's a very simple one. So it's like, um, think about, uh, let us say you are having, um, let us say, I'll tell you, yeah. For example, if there's something happens in US, for example, what happens? The first impact is on IT or stock exchange. And uh, post that, the dramatical impacts are on IT industry and all the related industries. So it's like, what is the probability of IT industry getting hit because of a historical event, or let us say, the, the crash of the US market, something like that. So if in case you have a, if a situation where you have to solve this kind of problems, Bayes' theorem will come to help. Now, how do we interpret this particular equation? It's very simple. I'll convert it in the form of a sentence. What is the probability of futuristic event A occurring if event, in B, event B has occurred in history or currently basically, okay? So what is this probability if this has already occurred? Now, coming to the right hand side, what is the probability of the current event occurring when this event was occurred? In history, if 
in his historical data if US market has crashed and IT industry was impacted, this is what it means. The reverse of the one which we see here. So this is nothing but the machine learning that we do. You remember in linear regression, we found out beta naught, beta one, beta two, that was machine learned. In this case, this is machine learned. This particular term, we call it likelihood function. Okay. Finally, into the probability of the futuristic event divided by the probability of the current event. That's it. This is how you transform Bayes theorem into a sentence. Very simple. Or else if somebody needs it, you can re remember in the terms of posterior and likelihood. So these two are the, this is the output. This is, the, this, this is what exactly machine learns basically in our current algorithm. Okay. So at least 50% clear Bayes theorem. Yeah. If not, if you guys are still confused, do let me know. I will give you some links to some blogs. So I think you can go through. There are some good examples given there. So it will make better. Okay. Let's simulate a simple uh, new base uh, algorithm. It's, it's a very simplistic uh, algorithm. So let's, let me show you how it works and then we'll go on to the Python code of it. So for example, let me clean this up. Give me a minute. For example, there is a golf course. Okay. And uh, this particular golf course has to take a decision every day whether to keep it closed depending on the weather or to keep it open. This is the target variable that we are looking at. Now, how do we get this is depending on the data on the left hand side. So the type of day we have got is sunny, overcast or rainy. The temperature that we are currently seeing is either hot, mid or cool, something like that. Humidity is high, normal. Windy, there is no wind that day or probably it's not windy and it is windy. So depending uh, on these features or these characteristics in past, the golf course has used these options to either keep it open or keep it closed. Now tomorrow in future, now this golf course basically wants to automate itself. So one day prior to this, uh, let us say tomorrow, if there is a, there is a decision to be taken whether to keep it open or not. Probably at uh, evening when they run this simulation, they, the simulation will give them an answer whether to uh, keep it open or closed. That's it, our direct answer. Now, how do we do this is very simple. In future, so if this is the combination, if you see here, this is the output. What if, what if I have a combination like this? Let us say today is overcast. Okay, it is hot. Let us say humidity is normal and windy is equal to two. What if I get a weird combination like this, which is not present in anything here? So what is the probability using which I will say that I should keep the golf course open? So what if I try to find out when I combine all these features using this learning, I say that the probability which I found when I keep all these features together and we found a probability of 0 0.78, that means 78%. Anything above 50%, we should say it is uh, yes. Anything below 50%, we should say it's no. So this is the aim. This is our final aim using which we will calculate our probability. Okay. Let's see uh, how exactly we can do it. So I know it's a little basic here, but again, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessary to understand the probability table and all, but it will be good if you guys can just, I'll show you one of the tables and just, I think you can get it. So what I've done is I've built a probability distribution table here, wherein we will count first of all, what is the probability of being yes. So if I want to say, give me P of yes for play, it will be, we have nine yeses here. That means we have nine by 14 because 14 number of total number of data we have. 64% chances are there for this goal course, it will be open and 35% are, uh, it will be closed kind of. Uh, overall probability. Now coming to one particular column. So let me calculate the probability of P of D. Okay. Now we have three type of uh, features like uh, variables here, sunny, overcast and rainy. Sunny, overcast, rainy. Total number of sunny occurrences is five out of which two of them are leading to yeses. So if you see here, this one and this one, if you look at the answer, they are yes. Output is yes. And three of them are tending to be uh, golf course is closed. So now if I want to find out what is the probability of day being sunny and the golf course being open, that is nothing but P of yes. How do I do it? 2 divided by 9. When I do this, I only get 0 0.2. Similar to that, if you want P no, 3 by 5, that is 0 0.6. 
like that I do it for overcast. So for overcast, there are four occurrences and all four of them are yes. So no matter what it is, if the day is overcast, the golf course was always open. So I'll say four by nine, that is 0.4. So like that, when I calculate the complete probability for this particular row or column, the total I should get yeses as nine as a verification yes. The total no's I should get five, that is my verified data. Total probability should be one. Total probability of no should be one. So this is what we are going to focus on for our naive based model. So like this, I will do the same table which I showed you here for temperature separately, for windy separately and for humidity separately. We'll do all the three, all the four tables separately. Now, what was our problem? Our problem was tell me probability of keeping the golf course open when it was overcast. So what is the answer of that? 0.4 into what is the probability of uh, golf course being open if the temperature is hot. So in that case, we'll come to hot and we'll circle this into what is the probability when humidity was normal here. We have the probability radius 0.7 into when the windy was true. So when windy is true this much. So when you multiply all of them, you will get your name base classifier. That's it. So when you multiply all four of them, you'll get one final percentage. If the percentage is more than 50%, you say keep the golf course open. If it is less than 50%, obviously should be no. That's how Navebase operates. So this was the background of uh, Navebase on a very simplistic way. And uh, now let me show you how exactly we do it. On the same data set I have taken. So, um, uh, guys, uh, for the coding part, you want me to explain line by line, or are we good with it, like the way we did last time? Yeah, we are we are good with that. And one one question, Krishna, you know, like uh, we have seen the, in the Excel uh, mm -hmm. on different you know, uh, variables, and uh, finally we are coming to you know, like if it is less than fifty percent zero and more than fifty percent one. Mm -hmm. In day, in a regular day activity, we are working. On this Excel or we are on Python? We are on Python. Yeah. We'll be working on Python, but this is what happens on the back end of Excel when we call our name based classifier. Okay. So let me show you the classifier. If we look at this particular classifier, if you see yeah. here, yeah. this name based classifier is what? Is nothing but a small function which the developer has written. So whenever you want it, you can call the function. So when we call the function and we deliver the values, so if you remember, what we do is we put nibase dot fit and then we give the training data. So the training data will go in and using the training data, all the tables that I showed you here will be built up. All these tables will be built up in, in the back end of the, uh, the function will reply accordingly. So this was just to show you that this happens on the back end, not on the Excel file. Definitely. Okay. Perfect. Guys. Thank you. So now let me show you one simple example. So pandas numpy as it is, uh, SQL and pre-processing imputer. So we are going to you know, change some of the values. So if you see here in our data set, uh, we have got almost all of them are categorical variables. Yeah, there are no numbers here. So we are supposed to convert them into numbers. So that was the first thing. That's the reason we use the pre-processing imputer and the pre-processing function. Post that, our train test split, and then we are going to call our Gaussian name base. Gaussian in the sense, uh, uh, it, it is almost inclined towards normality and all this concept. That's why we call it Gaussian. But again, it's a user defined function. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, next is uh, the way we calculate our confusion matrix. So I will take you guys through today. What is confusion matrix and how do we deal with it? Okay. Uh, last time in logistic regression, did I show you guys confusion matrix? I think no, right? Yes, I think you did it. You did it? Okay. Perfect. If in case anybody wants to repeat, do let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. So these are my live. Uh, Krishan, can you, uh, can you explain the, the imputer? The, the, this, this imputer code is not explained in the classes. And yes. I've seen this in a couple of videos, in a couple of sample case studies as well. That this yes. code is used. So I'm not able to get it properly. Got it. I will do it down the line. So we have done an imputing function down sure. the line. Okay. This is just a library for our reference. Perfect. So now the same data set I'm, I'm, I'm getting in whatever we saw. Okay. I'm storing it in the form of uh, some variable called DB. And when I generate it, this is how I get it. And this is my target variable. These are my independent variables. Uh, I'm checking if in case there is a missing value. So for that is 
null. So I usually call it if null. Is if it is null, uh, sum it up. So I'm, we are going to get if in case there was a null value, we are going to get the number of it. So this is it. Uh, but guys, don't worry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a separate session. So uh, in middle of some of the projects, no, you will get one week free where there will be no content released. At that time, I will take one whole session on how to clean the data, how to do all these analysis and do a better cleaning part of it. So for now, this is just to understand whether there is a null value present or not. Okay. Now, yeah. just wanted to show you one simple, uh, you know, confusion that usually happens when you start up with this Python coding and all. See, look at the data set. Do we have any column which has numbers except this one? So this is just a generic column which is showing me SL number. That's it. Apart from that, we do not have anything. So when you do dot describe function for this, now what's going to happen? It's going to identify only columns which are having actually numbers into it. So here, by mistake, if we, didn't, if we do not remove this column, what's going to happen? The describe function is showing me some junk value, which is not needed. But if this was not there, the describe function will show me nothing. Why? Because it does not understand categories. So be very careful. If you want dot describe function to be working perfectly, we have to convert these into category, uh, continuous numbers. So now we will do that. So for that, what I'm doing is I'm calling the imputer function. Okay. Now the library's name is called preprocessing and the name of the function is called label encoder. So what do we do in this label encoding is we call this function and Python, what it does is Python gives zeros and ones, how many categories we have. So if I go up again, if we go to the data set. So let me go here itself. So for, if we take the example of this, yeah. So alphabetically, let us say which comes first, sunny, overcast or rainy. I think overcast comes first. So overcast will get a value zero, uh, PQRS. So this will get rainy will get the value one and sunnies will get the value two. So we are going to replace all these by zero, ones and twos. Got it? So rather than using a categorical data, now my intention is to convert every data that we have in the form of numbers. So for that, we use label encoder, very simple. Okay, so now I'm calling my LE, which is nothing but my label encoder, and I'm fitting and transforming my each and every column that has uh, categorical variables to some kind of lists over here. And post that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transform the list as a separate column. So this is called column imputation where the original data set is only this much. Now I'm creating my new columns called uh, day con, con cate, categorical, temporal, categorical, humidity, windy, play area, something like that. So we have got the right hand side is full of numbers. The left hand side is full of categories. Okay. Now, if you observe the same data they've, we have got here. Now, what is my intention is my intention is to remove them because I don't need them anymore because I have got a very good numbered data frame ready. So what do I do is I use some variable. Okay, one minute. I use some variable called dummies field, for example. And then I say, these are my columns. Okay, please drop them. That's it. Very simple. Give me a minute, I'll change the color, so good. So drop what? Drop all the dummies fields and access is equal to one. That means I'm referring to columns. Okay, good. And guys, do you know the in place function here? In drop? In place is yeah. true. You know, right? So be very careful if you are re imputing your original data set, if this was not there on the left hand side, if you are imputing on the same thing, do in place is equal to true. It's going to work. If you don't do in place is equal to true, visually the rows will be removed, but actually on the back end, on the memory side, rows will be there. But if in case you are overwriting your uh, thing like with an assignment, then no problem. You don't need in place function at all. Here. Good. So now moving on, this is how my data set looks like. We are ready to go on to uh, machine learning. So till this stage, we did data preparation. So the data is ready to move on. Next step, we have to split between our independent variables and a dependent variable. So this top zero, one, two, three are my independent. And the fourth one is my dependent one. Okay. So once I do that, uh, next we are going to split it into training and testing data. So usually we do 70, 30 split and uh, random state. If I, if you ask me, how do you, uh, so guys, we know this, right? What is random state? How do we choose it? Yes or no? Yes. 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 yes? Good. So I, my suggestion is keep this random state below 10% of the whole data set size. Then this is going to be very good. 
because randomly we are choosing the data. So if you if you give a huge number, then uh, there are sometimes chances of biasing the data. Okay. So usually if, uh, if for this case, the data size is 14, right? For example, it should be around one random state. So do it like that. Else, even if you put whatever, it's not going to make much difference, but yes, I feel sometimes it, it makes a little difference in biasing. It, it doesn't matter the what is the number we get to random state because in the videos it told me that doesn't matter what yes. is the number of random state is, Correct. as long as it's some number. Exactly right. But what does random state do is, random state will pick up, if you say 10, it will pick 10 consecutive values at one time and put it into the training data set. So there are chances that the consecutive values are kind of similar. So when we try to push similar value, let us say it was 100 in the in other case. So we are getting 100 consecutive values at a time. So there are chances that we are bringing some kind of biasing. That's why I said you can make it around 10% of your whole data set. Okay, not more than that at least. I have seen some of sometimes people use one, two, three, four also randomly. They choose anything they like. Okay, so you are right. It doesn't matter much, but if you want a little more precise answer and if you are going to be a little cautious about biasing, better do follow this step. Okay, perfect. So moving on. Now what I'm doing, I'm calling my Gaussian name based classifier. I'm storing uh, my own model as CLF. Then I'm fitting the model onto my training data. Good. Once we do that, we are uh, predicting Y. So for that, we are calling the same model from above. Why? Because it is machine learned. We are predicting on our testing data. And finally using the predicted value Y and the original value of Y test, this is the actual data set value. This is my predicted value. When I subtract or when I find a score between these two, I get an accuracy of 100%, which I feel is a little over the top. Why? Please remember one thing. Whenever in these machine learning models, when you get a very high accuracy, you, know, you be a little cautious because it will perform very good on a known environment. Known environment means the X train and X, uh, the X and Y data that we have currently. Tomorrow, when you change the production data itself, a new data comes in, this might not be that. This is what is observed usually. We call it overfitting. So we are going to discuss something like decision tree, ensemble, you know, at that time we will bring back this concept. So for now, you don't have to worry about overfitting part of it. So here accuracy is 100% is very good. I'll tell you why. The only reason accuracy is very good because there are only 14 number of columns. That's the reason because there is, there is no much challenge over here. Okay, good. So anything more than 75, I feel is a good accuracy. Not bad. Anything more than 90 is the best. Now, moving on, I'm bringing a futuristic data. So usually I don't stop at this. In your codes, you would have seen we stop at this. That's it. Just to check how it works out end to end, I am bringing a futuristic data. This is how my future data looks like. Now, whatever data you have, be very careful. The number of columns and the variety of the columns that you have should be exactly same as the one you have trained your model onto, except the target column. Okay, see if you see here the target column is missing, except that the train, the, the X independent variable should be perfectly same and they should be a perfect same nature also. Okay, data type should be perfectly matching. Otherwise, this model will fail, whatever we did about CLF model. Now, next, whatever futuristic data, we have to take the data through again the cleaning process, whatever we did about. So, this is the same process that I have done about. So, we are using label encoder and then finally we are removing unwanted stuff if we have it. Post that, what we do is we get a new columns and now we are ready to be to do the prediction. So now what do I do is I call my one minute. Yeah, I call my classifier CLF from above, which we have learned. I use my dot predict function on what? On the new data set, which is DB2, this one. Okay. And finally, we get the output uh, ready. So these are my zero means keep it closed, ones mean keep it open. And finally, when I impute it and show it to you guys, it, this is how it looks like. So if this is the combination, keep the golf course closed. If this is the combination, keep the golf course open. That's it. So this is your name base classifier. Oh, so all these codings, we have to uh, depend on Stack Overflow or uh, uh, some other sites all the time, or uh, it will come in over a period of time. Uh, I will say it should come over the period of time. So probably you can hold on for one more module. So I would request you guys to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, start writing your own codes. Even if, you know, we fail for one or two times, 
But post that, yes, definitely you will get the feel of it. Okay. So you have to code basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good. So if you don't get any code, no, please do let me know. I'll be happy to, you know, translate it in a normal language and explain it to you guys also till you guys are comfortable with it. Yeah. Do stop me and let me, let me know if in case you have any questions on the code part of it. Okay. If you guys are from Java and those oops background, then picking up this should not be a big deal. But if in case you are new to coding itself, yes, I agree with you. But the learning curve should not be that, uh, you know, should not be that big. You will, you will pick it up. Yeah. Perfect. So this is it. This is the name base. Any questions for me? This is as simple as that. So if once I give this to you guys, you can even use, if you remember logistic regression problem statement that we had, even you can put it here and run your model. It should work good. But, but whenever, whenever uh, this particular, uh, the problem comes, like, you know, on new base problem comes, that time all coding will remain same, only the, the, the parameters will change. That's it, right? Exactly, exactly. So I'll show you from where it will change. It will, it will, it will uh, change, like the, the difference between two different data sets will only will be till here. After this, it's going to remain exactly same. There is no change at all. This is universal code. Okay. And I usually put it as a function. So when I do it in the industry side, what I do is I put the whole thing as one function. So I have got a small box lying in some part of my server as a microservice. When I split my data and when I, you know, split my data in X and Y and uh, train and test, I give that to this service called Navebase and the standard code will do all the calculation and throw an output to me as a score. That's it. Okay. So whatever we do outside this is data cleaning, data preparation. Yes, it will be different for different, different uh, data sets. Yeah? Perfect. So usually what I do is I show three to four implementations each session. So you guys will be comfortable. Don't worry. We'll hold on for one or two sessions. You guys will become a little comfortable with the coding part also. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. You were explaining the imputer code. Yes. Here it is. Uh, this one is the imputer. Okay, this is the imputer. Code. Yeah. Okay. So I, we have three different types of imputers. One is called uh, dot dummies function. One is called label encoder, and one is called dot replace function. Today I will show you all three of them in different different codes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So the purpose of this imputer code is just to convert our categorical variables into continuous variables. That's it. With the classification techniques, the parametric and non-parametric and kernel based, the smooth and the cross validation. Right? Uh, a small pop quiz. All right. Uh, so can you name few parametric and non-parametric models used for classification? Parametric is uh, name based discriminant analysis and logistic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Non-parametric is three. Decision uh -huh. tree, uh, gradient boost. Uh -huh. Gradient boosting. Gradient boosting. And the SVM also you can put it as a non-parameter. SVM is also a non-parameter. Right. So what is the concept of an, uh, what is the concept, which concept is the base for a naive base? Base theorem. Base theorem is the base concept of the naive base algorithm that we are going to use. Name any kernel based model used for classification. SVM. SVM, the support vector machine. All right. So, with that, we'll see compare between what is a parametric and what is a non parametric. So, what is parametric model uh, in the terms, whatever you have learned? What is a parametric model? There is a formula. When there is a formula, we call that as a parametric model. If any algorithm learns by a predefined that formula, the map the function that you call it as a parametric. This is the proper definition that we have to get it like. If any algorithm learns by its predefined map the function, we call that algorithm as a parametric. For example, y is equal to b naught plus beta one into x. The simple linear regression is a parametric. It's an example of a parametric model. All right. So, uh, for example, if it does not follow in linear distribution, what kind of transformations will you use? We have seen it last week also. 
if the distribution is not linear in nature if it is not normal distributed how do you transform the data to convert to a linear distribution a uh, log log we take log log and the other methods i can take a square also you can take a square you can take a cube you can take a square root right and uh, so what are the advantages of using in parametric model is like it uses a fixed number of parameters to build the model right like y is equal to v not plus v1 into x we know the formula if we know all the formula the terms the parameters we can able to find the dependent variable there. right and considers strong assumptions about the data the assumptions is like the variances must be equal in nature the homoscedasticity density and the normal distribution all those assumptions are seen in the parametric model and it's computationally faster right since we are going to plug it into the predefined formula and we are going to get the result even with the lesser data the parametric model is going to work out and uh, the examples for a parametric model are the logistic regression and the naive bayes model and what about the non parametric model what is a non parametric model in your language simple language and i'll tell you some process based which is a process based so it does not make any assumptions regarding the uh, the mapped function there is no mapped function here right? and there is no mathematical function involved in the non parametric model right there are no assumptions here Right. free to learn from the training data set it is flexible number of parameters to build the model right for example uh, if i'm going to take the kn the decision trees the the naive bayes the svm neural networks we call all this model as a non parametric models why non parametric because in kn and k nearest neighbor we are not going to use any formula right i'm going to take a feature vector and uh, i'm going to select k size whatever the variables are near to it highest variable i'm going to give that as my decision variable decision vector right? there is no formula involved right the parameters is, is going to be the k the k value that i'm going to select similarly in the decision trees how many trees that i have to have what is the min bucket what is the min split only that things i have to give as part of my hyper training and uh, it is computationally slower because there is no formula involved and we require lot of data to do it not result in the non parameter all right so and what else okay uh, yes sir yes sir industry application boosting simplifies complex prediction tasks in the energy sector security of bulk electric power system is an opportunity in modern power engineering due to the continued growth in renewable energy generation most energy most energy management systems like siemens and abb etc use one or more security assessment predictors such as sensitivity matrix security indicators distribution factors fast decoupled load flows etc to reduce the computational effort of the security assessment methods for the assessment of security and voltage stability of electric power system shows that traditional approaches cannot be effectively applied on real time conditions because of their computation complexity research shows that the use of bagging and boosting models is particularly helpful in solving solving these challenges very efficiently very efficient so our problem statement here is the security security uh, how are we going to achieve the security what is the security here so the preventive measures the uh, if the de demand is very higher and if there is no demand so there will be some problem in the power systems the electric power systems so we need to have some preventive control actions and emergency control actions after the disturbances we can uh, read this using the reference so what these people have done is they have taken the data variables such as the voltage variables the voltages power flow the loads for each and every time and they have calculated what is the security index for the forthcoming time right so what will the uh, security index they have given the security index as uh, some zero normal state alarm state some emergency state they have given on second i'll show that 
the normal state alarm state emergency one state emergency two state based on the sa the security index how did they calculate the security index by taking number of variables such as the voltages what is the power flows what is the loads for each and every area so based on that they have used a boosting technique a non ensemble technique to find the security index all right so this is a very detailed study you can have a look so it will have will give you a good exposure how in real life this uh, techniques have been used and another example a boosting techniques for an tumor detection all right so here uh, let me just brief you uh, before reading into the case study and all so what they have done in they want to identify the tumor right manual inspection of those images is a tedious job right where in the image whatever we have received where is the tumor present and where is the tumor not present? so the manual inspection of those images is a tedious job as the amount of data and the minute details are hard to recognize by the human and often lacks calibration right and it varies from individual to individual there is there is a chance of flaws to happen in the manual inspection so what they have done they have taken the number of images and they have built and boosting techniques right from the boosting techniques what is the possibility what is the propensity score for x or y patient to get a tumor from the images right and they are giving the possible percentages so these are the two real time example just an industry application so we are doing with an sample data where have they used in the real time uh, that question may arise right so we have to put some two industry application so please read this industry application if you can get in paper and discuss it it is a very lengthy approach right i cannot explain it here and a case study that we are going to look at today uh, is an us heart patient case study right so 5 million americans are currently living with heart disease and the numbers expected to rise this is very important to understand the factors which causes heart attacks so that certain precaution can be taken by the individual right so what they have given the number of variables such as the gender age education current smoker the cigarettes per day uh, per day that he has smoked and uh, bp medication that the person is taking prevalence stroke and hypertension the diabetes the number of variables out of which we have to predict whether the person had a heart attack or did not have a heart attack we have labeled a column it's a supervised learning technique based on all this data when a new data point comes in we have to predict that the person will have a heart attack will not have a heart attack and what is the propensity score for it all right so this is a classification model technique so what is the purpose of doing this is like you will have an idea of all the models all the possible models uh, i am not telling all the possible models all the possible models what we are learning as part of this program and the data dictionary gives like the attributes gender is the male female age of a person education right based on that we want to identify the dependent variable one whether the person suffered from heart attack zero indicates uh, indicate that the person will not suffer from heart attack all right Just going to the uh, python file so this is a very detailed python file so that is the reason i don't want to waste time and other explaining the parametric non parametric in detail so whenever we are going to look at each and every model i'll give you one small overview about each and every model right if we go into random forest what does a random forest mean what does a decision tree mean what does a knn model mean we'll discuss that as we execute the uh, python file all right is it okay shall i move to the python file you have any yes, doubts sir. so far yes sir so please open the python file along with me we have lot of time so we'll make sure that we work along and uh, clarify all the doubts um right and i'm importing the data us heart patients and the exploratory data analysis so take command the shape 
is going to give me the number of rows, the records, and the number of variables. 16 variables are present, including the dependent variable, the heart attack. And the number of rows, the records are 4,240. So how do you identify the, uh, the data types and data features? Info, info. DF dot info. Right. So what is the problem here? The gender is an object, age is an float, that's a numerical. Education here is an, actually it's an object, it's an factor. It is an uh, ordinal data. It's a categorical data. But since it is a number, Python by itself, it's taking it as a float. So we have to convert that to an ordinal data. Okay, and then uh, the current smoker. Whether he is a smoker or not a smoker. And uh, the cigarettes smoke per day. And uh, the diabetes, whether the person has diabetes or he does not have a diabetes. It's again a categorical data. The hyper, uh, prevalent hypertension is also a categorical data. Prevalent stroke is also a categorical data. So the numerical data here is the age column, the total cholesterol, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure and the BMI and heart rate and glucose. So other than that, we have many number of categorical data. So what we have to do, we have to take the dummy encoding or the one hot encoding and we have to use it for the model. So before that, what is a step-by-step -step procedure? So we have a data set, how to approach the data? Now, I think one or two months down the line, we have to start the capstone project. So you get a data set like this. What is the procedure now? What is the first step to look at? What should you inspect? One hot encoding. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, missing values, duplicate values, outliers. Okay. Missing values, outliers. Then? Duplicate values, then we have to do one hot encoding to convert all the okay. categorical variables into okay then right maybe scaling uh and then what maybe sc scaling and then trend scaling test. scaling yes scaling right then trend test split and then okay uh we have to do also the univariate and the bivariate analysis the visualization part is also important whatever you said is right so along with it you also add the univariate and the bivariate analysis right univariate is we are going to see the distribution for each and every variable bivariate is we are combining Two or uh, two variables is bivariate. Multivariate is we are going to compare many number of variables, right? So first we have to look for the missing data, then uh, uh, treat the missing values, then outlier detections. Look for the uh, the bivariate, the univariate, bivariate plots, all right? And then you get into the and you have to do the scaling. When we are going to do for K N and all K nearest neighbors, scaling is the must, all right? Since uh, it is going to take in distance measures, right? Scaling is a must. Thing. And the value counts, and we could see here, it is a uh, categorical data, the education, the current smoker, whether is a smoker or not a smoker. The people who do not smoke is 2,143, and people who smokes is 2,094, all right? And BP medication, and the prevalent stroke, and the hypertension, and the diabetes and heart attack. So the proportion is normalized. So 84% is majority class and 15% is minority class. Is it is the data imbalanced or it is a balanced data? Imbalanced. Okay, why imbalanced? Four is a uh, big number as compared to 15. Okay, so a perfect balance at this 50 50. 50 50 is not going to happen, right? So it's always as a rule of thumb greater than 20 to 25 percentage. It's uh, some okay, okay, it's somewhat an okay balance data. If you want to verify, we have to also use some smoke technique, and if the accuracy improves, then we have to go again with the smooth technique only, right? Do not work with the imbalance data. However, you're going to train or uh, tune the hyperparameters, it is not going to affect. 
all right so uh, change the data types of the seven features the seven features the seven features which i wanted to tell is the education is a current smoker so the categorical variables all right the cigarette smokes per day is a numerical and the bp medication the prevalent stroke hypertension and the diabetes and heart attack so these variables are all categorical in nature which are uh, given as integer as and floats numerical uh, so gender will also be into that right okay gender is so already gender object. is already yeah gender is already taken it as an object so since these are all numbers in nature right so python has taken it as uh, numerical right so what i'm giving it as cat categorical is nothing but education education current and the bp medication prevalent stroke and the prevalent hypertension other the person has diabetes and uh, total cholesterol not systolic diastolic bmi heart rate glucose and the uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, and heart attack. So a simple for loop. So how do we do it? For i in cat, right? So each and every variable it is going to take df of i, all right? Df of i dot object, all right? So this is simple technique, simple simple for loops. You please make sure that you become familiar with. all right so when you are doing a very big program very big modeling and all you cannot give for each and every line as top object for so many lines you cannot do it it's going to be time consuming so you have to do many lines. all right this small small loops will be handy all right df dot info so it's all converted to objects the uh, into an category all right so making a different list for the categorical column a numerical column so what we have done here i have created two dummy list cat and uh, nms numerical for i in data columns df dot columns for each and every column name if the column type is object append it to the cat is equal to that uh, cat list else you append it to the numerical list right once if i do that i'm getting a list for a categorical data and numerical data now describe for the numerical and the categorical columns so the describe function is going to give a summary for all the numerical data what is the mean median what is the mean standard deviation and median also and the five point summary all right so we could see here total cholesterol is obviously in outlier and again systolic blood pressure diastolic all these are all outliers are present in the data so we have to treat for outliers before moving any further first we will look for the missing data so uh, before treating uh, before the outliers we have to treat the missing data all right then categorical variables describe so in the gender It is there are two unique the male and the female. The highest is female. All right. Similarly for each and every variable, which variable is the highest? All right. So unique values for the categorical variables. How do you, how do you check for the unique values in the categorical variable? A small for loop. This is easy uh, for you guys also. How do you check unique values in each and every? Categorical variables. I want something like this. I'm giving you the output also. For I in cat, print I. Okay. Yes. It will okay. not be exact, but it feels. I'm getting similar output. Okay. For I in. We already have list of uh, all the categorical variables. Yeah. Okay. For I in cat, you could do that. All right. So, and what was your uh, thing? Print I. First of all, we will print 
the column name mm-hmm. okay and print, print the I. if df of i dot value comes and value comes so this is what you are selling right we have to use slash and to create a space we can use the slash the escape character right the gender uh, so for each and every categorical variable so we can make this as an upper case all those cosmetic things how to make this as an upper case dot upper so I what dot i upper. dot upper very good all right so and then and is required in the next slide next line mm-hmm. i mean the last line so we can add an escape character over here all right so for gender and female and uh, how many number of males present right so we are getting all the counts here so if you want to get the proportion we can give normalize is equal to true it is going to show the proportion for each and every categorical variable in the data right? are there any missing values how to check for the missing values again is no so df dot is an a uh, dot sum this is going to show me all the missing values present in the data so i am going to treat here the missing values with for the all the categorical data i am going to treat it with the mode right and for the numerical data if it is normally distributed i'll go with mean if there are outliers present i'll go with the median this is a very naive approach but still we'll go ahead with it all right so as we get progress uh, we will see how to treat the missing values with k n k nearest neighbor that is a very that algorithm is mostly used for the treatment of the missing values right and uh, all independent variables having the missing values check for any okay how to check for the duplicate records we check df dot duplicate duplicated right so here it is defined as dips right so therefore there are no duplicated record here present right so uh to save time all these things are given it already rename this column as without space and if there is space give it as an underscore all right the systolic blood pressure give underscore diastolic give blood underscore all right and uh, impute the missing values with the next possible option right the mode for gender female i'm going to treat the missing value for uh, the gender we have eight missing value in gender so i'm going to treat all the variables with female all right and for the age age there is uh, no outlier present therefore i'm going going ahead and uh, treating the missing value with the mean value all right so fin in a try to stop me it i don't know why did i give as 48 okay we go ahead with the mean value what main point i show in the object variables in a loop using the mode right for all the categorical data education the current smoker bp meds and the prevalence of hypertension i have whatever it is present all the categorical data if there is missing value treat it with the mode right and the mode returns as a two values right so you take the first one that's what they are giving it here and it's all treated and uh, i'm converting it as an object the cigarette smoke per day has one outlier so for whatever the outlier is present we are going to treat it with the median value and cigarette smoke per day we are going to treat it with the nga Uh, as zero uh, and the total cholesterol has number of outliers so outliers to impute the value total cholesterol dot median is going to give me 234 so for the total cholesterol variable i am going to treat it with the 
median value all right and uh, so, uh, systolic blood pressure has a number of outliers so this outliers again i'm going to treat it with the median i'm sorry uh, all the missing values i'm going to treat it with the median and the diastolic blood pressure again has an outlier it has been treated with median and the bmi also has number of outliers i'm treating it with median and if i could check there are no missing values so what i have done for all the numerical data uh, with the median if uh, the outliers are present for all the categorical data we have just taken the mode and we have imputed so is there any doubt here so is it going any kind of bore or these are all simple things that's why i am going moving on fast so is there any disturbance in my voice or is it clear Let's go ahead. Clear. Clear. Okay. okay. All non-values have been appropriately imputed, so we are checking it. If the data type is object, and uh, check the unique values again, and converting the categorical and numerical variables again. All right. So univariate analysis. How do I do this? How do I do this plot? i hope uh, the solution is present or not present i do not know so how do you not do present. this univariate analysis box uh, we will have one for loop for which we will uh, for every column we okay. will apply box plot as well as uh, distribution plot okay okay so before that how do you install it how, what are the variables that subplots thing how do you give it in the library now uh yes this library if i want a plot like this right how do you do it how do you do subplots you are able to understand my question plt dot subplots yeah plt dot subplots plt dot subplots you have to give it subplots so what do i want to give n rows is equal to 4 in call is equal to right so i'm going to refer it to big comma axis all right so and then once this is done i have to set so once this is done i'll get a, a plot a empty plot like this so i have to set the figure size fig size uh fig set something will come fig dot set set size right ah set size inches set size inches 10 comma 8 something we are going to do all right now i have gotten i am getting in big plot now i want a this plot what is this plot called as histogram this plot and the this plot is present in this C bond. S N S. Okay, C bond. So I'm giving just a variable name S N S. This plot, this plot, D F of what do I want? Age. Okay, I want age. And how do I give the axes? A X is equal to axes. A X. Yes. Axes of zero. All right. I'm getting in this plot over here. I can make it even more bigger. Right? Okay, exactly. It will become bigger for the age. S N S dot box plot. S N S dot box plot. D F of age. Axis equal to A X S. Axis you have to refer the axis zero comma one. All right. And then that is how we get the ID. Just for one thing, we'll do it, and then I'll copy paste from the solution for it. How do you set the title for any C bond? Set title. Uh, set title. So I have to refer it a dot set title. Set title. Uh, what age? Age distribution something. Distribution. All right. So I can give a font size also for this. 
Uh, I think I can see it. One size is equal to something, something. Right. So you're getting age distribution. Similarly, you can set title for this age distribution box block, some name of your choice. Age distribution block. All right. So similarly, you can plot for all the variables. You can plot for the cigarettes per day distribution. So all right. Then what what is the thing that you have to do? If you have to refer to this axis. I'm just going to copy paste the same thing. If you want to refer to, so it is going to be one comma zero. If I'm going to refer to this plot, one comma one, then it is two comma zero, and it is two comma one. All right. So I'm going to change the referral axis so that we can create beautiful subplot. So this could be a very handy technique when you're going to submit your caption report. All right. Instead of taking many plots. So you'll be given a constraint for each and every caption project. You have to submit your project notes within five to six pages, right? So if you're going to plot it individually, right? So you'll be wasting lot of spaces in the pages, right? Other than that, if you could uh, use three or four subplots, right? You could uh, you can show it very beautiful plot. You could add colors and uh, give titles. It will be visually pleasing, and you can get marks for that also. All right. Then uh, the other plot is similarly. I have given the figure and the axis, the diastolic blood pressure, uh, the BMI, the heart rate, the glucose, everything. I am going to check the univariate. So what we could see here is there are outliers present in the diastolic, and the BMI is in a place, and you can see the skewed is already present. Heart rate also has an. Uh, skewed data. It's it also has an outliers and glucose has also an outliers. So we have to treat the outliers before we are going to enter the model. Right. Okay. So right. The strip plot is again another beautiful plot. Right. Last time we have seen it comparing with the dependent variable to the independent variable. The strip plot gives a very visually pleasing plot. Right. You could also use some scatter plot. Scatter plot is also a very good plot. It's uh, uh, recognized worldwide. Whenever you are going to do any model, scatter plot is a must. Scatter plot is de facto. Scatter plot and box plot will give a very good representation. Here we are going to use a strip plot comparison between the age and the heart attack. Only the younger people have less probability of heart attack. This pattern is uh, visible. However, the probability of heart attack is uh, low even for the old age people, as per the above strip plot. The, the inference, whatever the plot that they are going to make, gives an inference of plot. Doing the heavy lifting of all the codings, the inference is what it matters. And the strip plot between the heart attack and the cigarette smoke per day. Put it and uh, there is some uh, different thing. The people who did not get a heart attack got say smoked more cigarettes per day. So probably they'll get heart attacks in sometime near future or something like that. With the data that we have, uh, lesser probability of heart attack, less count of cigarettes per day. These people got a heart attack on the cigarettes smoked per day is higher. It is counterintuitive. Okay. However, the data set has records wherein the probability of heart attack is zero. And uh, total count cigarettes per day is quite high. So in this data, what we have is the people who did not smoke. All right, uh, the people who smoked a lot did not get heart attack. Right. So maybe the sampling of the data is not perfect enough. I'm not commenting about that, but that's the observation from the data. The heart attack and the total cholesterol level. All right, and uh, it's somewhat equal here. And the heart attack and the system blood pressure. The people who had heart attack had somewhat marginally higher blood pressure compared to people who did not have heart attack. And the diastolic blood pressure, are marginally again, uh, it's more or less same for the people who did not get heart attack and people who got a heart attack. The BMI and heart attack. Already we could see uh, the BMI of the people who had an heart attack is marginally higher. Comparison to people who did not get a heart attack, 
and the heart attack and the heart rate heart rate people who did not get a heart attack the heart rate is higher in comparison in contrast to the people who got heart attack all right so we are comparing for uh, again one more last the heart attack and the glucose level the higher value of glucose higher chances of heart attack so these are the observations that we have uh, got from the step plot Right. the correlation plot all right how do you use the correlation here right. we will let's get into the model and uh, i'll keep explaining what all the modeling things these are all the basic things that we have seen so far so it's going in monotonous discussion so what is the command to check for the correlation okay so sns dot heat map right. heat map of plot and where our notation is equal to true right so there is a clear correlation between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure are highly correlated one of them should be would be dropped so we are dropping in systolic blood pressure here and i am checking correlation again so there is no correlation between any other variables it's good for model and then fair plot all right so the cigarette smoke per day so as we have seen in this triple current due to and uh, the heart rate is somewhat normally distributed it has two players all right so let's go ahead and get the dummy for all the data and start the modeling and check out clear so clear are present for glucose heart rate bmi blood pressure the total cholesterol so all has an outliers so the outlier treatment as we have known our uh, traditional way old technique the quartile 1 then quartile 3 i am taking the 25th percentile and 75th percentile and i am treating the outliers right so i am writing i am writing a function here right a uh, writing and function to remove the outliers for whatever the variable that I'm getting first of all sort it and give the 25th percentile and give the 75th percentile and the interquartile range is given by q3 minus q1 and i'm getting the lower range and the upper range and it returns the lower range and upper range to wherever the function has been called is there any doubt in this function guys any doubt isma jafar jafar you are there no sir and for all the variables i am treating with the outliers right i am just using this remove outliers i am giving it a for loop so for each and every column it goes to the for loop and it treats the outliers right whatever the value is upper uh, greater than the upper treat it with the ur else df dot call in var function from the numpy var function var function what it does is something like if it is greater treat it with ur else give the same value if it is less than lower range i give it with the lower range the value or else give the same value so it's clear visible so all the outliers has been treated using the lower range and the upper range and very important thing to note is we are scaling using a function different function so what does it mean here what does it mean here okay mx function lambda x function is okay what kind of scaling am i doing here i want the name of the scaling mean no standardization min max min max function min max scaling is also called as an normalization normalization all right you can use either in standardization technique that just code technique or you can again go ahead with the normalization technique both are doing the same job right here uh, what it takes so what it takes is it takes the minimum value and the maximum value so whenever you are going to do the normal the scaling function please treat the outliers up front only after treating the outliers we have to come to the the uh, scaling function else it is of uh, no use because the outliers is going to be highly affected right the missing values outlier treatment only then we have to come and treat the other uh, and then we have to come and scale the data 
ஜெண்டர் மேல் right giving gender male what is the possibility what is the probability of the person getting heart attack all right so we are going to use two probability what is that we are going to use uh, a prior probability and then posterior probability all right for example people who had heart attack what is it what is the total value it is 4240 the people who had heart attack is 644 600 the probability of heart attack is given by a priori probability yes probability of s given by 644 divided by 4240 right so probability of no is the opposite 1 minus 644 divided by 4240 all right so individual probabilities with respect to heart attack for example i'm going to take education education as 1 2 3 and 4 right and i'm going to filter the education out of in the education one how many people had heart attack given all right that is how we are going to look for the conditional probability education one education 1 given heart attack all right so the education 1 has a total record of uh, education 1 has a total record of 322 divided by what do you get as a denominator now what do you get as a denominator yes so given education 1 people had heart attack is 322 out of the total people who had heart attack given the total people who had heart attack 322 divided by 644 that is what an conditional probability probability of x in the probability of no out of people who had heart attack how many people who did not get heart attack people who had, who did not get heart attack is 3596 3 5 9 given education 1 how many number all right that is how we have to see given education 1 how many all right 1 3 9 5 1 3 9 5 all right this is what an conditional probability means so we have seen in a bayes theorem that is what the similar technique we are going to use as part of our naive bayes model so what we'll get end of this the probability of x here it is nothing but the heart attack all right for the person a male a person being male and uh, the uh, the uh, person being the education is being one and uh, uh, and the cigarette smoke per day and he is a current smoker so i'm going to take probability of being male 
probability of being education equal to 1 into probability of being current smoker right i'm going to calculate all the probability values and the probability is the possibility of that particular record getting heart attack or not getting it is that clear any doubt here so a small confusion being had made so is there any is it clear or is there any doubt all right so now i have a question i have said for a categorical variable what about the numerical variable like age or numerical variable like total cholesterol how do you calculate the total probability here any idea guys isma monica any doubt, any any idea how do you calculate the probability for a numerical data so i suppose all these are covered in your video right mathematical uh, part was not covered okay okay so how do you calculate for a numerical data it's nothing but going to take the formula for a normal distribution all right what is the formula for a normal distribution f of x is given by what is the formula for a normal distribution any idea if you could recollect 1 divided by sigma 2 pi all right e power i think we didn't see this so that you may not know this divided by the 2 sigma square i think i'm right 1 divided by sigma into root 2 pi e power minus x minus mu the whole square divided by 2 sigma square so for the value whatever i give if i plug in the value of uh, uh, the standard deviation and the uh, the mean value and the record whatever the x value the f of x is nothing but it is going to give me a probability value all right that probability value i'm going to add here into the probability of what is the particular person's age all right since it is a numerical data i'm going to use the normal distribution function f of x and that value is going to be added here all right so all these things it does it automatically the ney bayes theorem the model is algorithm is going to do it automatically so in brief idea what does a model do inside uh, the python all right so how do you call the uh, ney bayes model so what are the applications of the ney bayes any idea where is it widely used it is widely used in credit scoring right multi class prediction it is used very important uses the text classification whether it is an spam or not an spam sentiment analysis right the ney bayes is uh, is leader when you are trying to do in text classification whether the particular mail is a spam or not a spam it uses a uh, word by word approach whether uh, this word is causing uh, more the more of this words have been used it is an spam or it is not an spam okay. so the leader is sk learn ney base i'm going to import gaussian in the right so i'm going to fit the training x and y and the performance matrix on train data how do i get this the performance matrix for uh, How do I get the confusion matrix for this? Report matrix. Read underscore model dot, and then we can. There will be one report parameter. Okay, okay. So from the matrix, we can directly call the classification report, or from the matrix library, we can call the confusion matrix directly. All right. Now what we are trying to do is first of all we have to predict. Predict what? What is the name of the model? The NB model. Using this model, dot predict. Predict what? Extreme. So my model is predicted now. Okay, I have lost. So let me do the NB model. Dot score. Right? Score of what? Y train. Comma, uh, sorry, extreme comma, right train. Okay. So I am also saving that as part of my 
model score correct now i am giving it as print model score if i do not use print command right only one of the thing will be printed right one of the one if you if i'm giving the object name directly multiple objects only one object will be printed if i instead given print command multiple objects will be printed right print from matrix mat or from matrix i want confusion matrix confusion matrix for y train and the prediction that we have made y train predict all right we have gotten confusion matrix and my model accuracy is 83% the confusion matrix i got i want to get the recall the sensitivity specificity precision recall i want all the other values from the matrix i call the classification report classification report of y test y train predict okay. classification report any okay for the train and train test right so i get an recall of 15 percentage all right i get a recall of mere 15 percentage for the minority class my minority class here is the one my precision is 0.37 right my accuracy here it's showing though it is an 83.173 so is my model doing good or bad how is my model doing what what is my model do here is my model doing a fair job or uh, an obsolete it's not doing a good job uh, that's what you are telling sandeep why 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 so uh, the because basis of the data set yes. is uh, highly unbalanced and it has 85% almost uh, no and uh, 15% yes so yes even if it is having 83% accuracy i don't think it's a it's it's a good model and my target class my sensitivity look at here i want to predict this people the people who are going to get heart attack this is my most vulnerable people right the type 2 error here so i want to identify more people who who are going to get heart attack or who had heart attack right with this model i am not going to get anywhere close to my uh, aim it's only 15 percentage i am able to achieve people who had heart attack my prediction has given right sometimes in medical they will give it and uh, they want an sensitivity value around 99.5 percentage something like that other than that the medical will not be the uh, model will not be used all right in that case is not this is a very obsolete model correct right. so again in test uh, i am checking the distribution the performance matrix i want the score the confusion matrix and the classification report so i want you guys to help me here first i want to predict right guys first i want to predict and i want to get the score and i want to get the confusion matrix and the classification report what is the first step that i have to do y test predict predict nb model predict of what it is nothing but what should i have to do here y test or what should i have to do here x test x test because why is the actual values right so you are going to make a prediction for the x the independent variable and i get a prediction and i'm going to store that put it the model in the model dot uh, okay great thanks vijay dot score is going to give me x test comma what should i have to give here y test we should not give the prediction value here all right so i get a model score now i print the model score and i print the confusion matrix confusion matrix of what white test 
the actual comma the predicted y test predict right so i have achieved the model accuracy is 83.11 and i got the confusion matrix and how should i get the classification report it is again given by matrix dot classification report all right and give the actual actual is y test and prediction y test predict this brings us to the end of this tutorial on naive base classifier and before you guys sign off i'd like to inform you folks that we have launched a completely free platform called as great learning academy where you have access to free courses such as ai cloud and digital marketing so guys thank you very much for attending the session and have a great learning ahead